are about to experience on this seminar today, this lecture that we're hosting. I would like to take this opportunity, this moment to recognize a few persons in our midst, uh, very important people who without them, we would not have been able to have this webinar, this, this seminar today on the topic we're discussing, but who have been working behind the scenes and have made today possible. First of all, thank you GIS for streaming today, for assisting us with live streaming. You're always very helpful when we call on you and we appreciate your presence and your help. I'd like to welcome my board of directors. Um, I'm not sure if they're all on yet, but at some point in time, they will be joining the board of directors of the Women's Center, my fellow directors, Dr. Zoe Simpson, the executive director of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, who again, I thank you so much for making it possible for this lecture today. Mrs. Avage Carr, human resource manager at the Women's Center and all the other members. If I should name everyone, um, I, I would be taking up the speaker's time today. Thank you for joining. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making it possible for this lecture today. Today also promises to be very entertaining because we, we have some entertainment lined up for you guys, so don't move. Um, you're going to enjoy the guest that we have, Ms. Candy Isaacs, who will be entertaining us at some point in time throughout our lecture. And of course, I could not go any further without mentioning our parent ministry, the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport with our very own minister, the Honorable Babsy Grange, whom again, without her, a lot of what we do at the Women's Center would not be possible. I also want to recognize our moderator, the esteemed Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson, Principal Director of the Bureau of Gender Affairs, whom you will be seeing very shortly and who will be taking us throughout this program today. Before I get to welcoming um, our very esteemed speaker this afternoon, I'm very excited to hear speak on this topic today in this lecture. Um, just making a quick look to see if I've forgotten anyone. I'm not sure if our minister will be joining us today or if a representative will, but nonetheless, her spirit is always with us with all we do. And so we know she's with us in spirit, though she may not be here physically. Today's speaker, Professor Opal Palmer Adisa, who wears many hats, so many hats. I mean, I, I, the list is so long. Gender specialist, poet, former director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies, um, lecturer, performer, um, actor. Can I say actor as well, uh, Professor Palmer? Because you do perform your work, uh, your many um, novels or, or books that you've written, so interesting, just a, a, a very flavorful life and career that you've had, Professor Palmer, and why it is as well that you are so suited to lead today's discussion. Welcome, Professor Palmer. And again, we look forward to hearing from you soon. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, that today is going to be your best day ever after participating in this lecture that we have planned for you. Today is going to be your best day ever. And I promise you, that with the flavor of what we're bringing to you, surrounding the discussion um, Dr. Uh, Professor Palmer will lead, you will not forget, forget the tastes. I, I, I pray that your taste buds will be tickled and that after this lecture, that any discussion you have surrounding this topic will bring you right back to what we would have discussed today and what we really are attaining to bring to the public a discussion that needs to happen and conversations that need to continue happening surrounding this topic. I will not say anything further. Thank you again for joining us. People are slowly coming on to the lecture. 
and I welcome you all and hope that you have a very educational lecture presented today by Professor Palmer and also infused with a lot of entertainment. I'm sure she will add some of her own um, as she speaks, but entertainment specifically from Miss Candy um, Isaacs, who will be joining us later on in the presentation. Welcome again, everyone, and have a great lecture. I'm still on, but you won't see me. Enjoy. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, board chair. Sorry, are you hearing a background? So I think, give me a minute, let me mute that. Thank you. Great. Okay, so thank you so much. Chair, so that was our very illustrious board chair. I'm trying to get the background feed out of the. I think it's okay. So this. Okay. Give me a minute. Okay. So this particular lecture, the Pamela McNeil lecture, was named in honor of the late visionary Pamela McNeil, and she has the history of being the first executive director of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation. The Women's Center was founded in response to the high level of teenage pregnancy that plagued this our island home for many years. There, Ms. McNeil at the center worked assiduously to ensure that young girls were integrated and reintegrated in the formal school system after being interrupt, having their pregnancy interrupted. And this year, we are having our fourth annual lecture. And this continues to be riveting across Jamaica, ensuring that while we speak about what is happening and what is our contextual realities that we strategize and we look for solutions. Today, we are going to have a very riveting discussion. We have an esteemed lecturer. You heard the chair introduce her. And this particular person has a wealth of experience. She is Professor Opal Palmer Adisa, former university director. IGDS, which is the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. So this our fourth annual lecture will inspire and no doubt will throw up a list of solutions. The theme I wish to share with you, adolescent pregnancy, breaking the cycle, protecting our girls. And this lecture we intend to have it send a clear message that our girls need protection and we must all come together as a country collectively and tackle the vexed issue of adolescent pregnancy in our country. Adolescent pregnancy, as you know, or may not know, continues to be a critical public health and social problem in many countries, Jamaica being no less. But there is hope. We actually have a, a place that's called the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, which we like to call a second chance opportunity organization, which allows for persons who have had their pregnancy while they're in school and have had their schooling interrupted to be able to continue learning while they are pregnant and after delivery to be able to continue learning. I wish to have the, is it that I should have Miss, uh, the, the, the um, entertainment on now? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to continue while we get the, the entertainment up. But before uh, I bring her on, I just wanted quickly to look at a few solutions while we get that sorted. Solutions to the problem. Now, I am Sharon Coburn Robinson, and I am at the Bureau of Gender Affairs. So the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation is our sister organization. I also wear the hat of being a past student of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation. 
and a part of the board of directors. So I wear several hats today. So I have just three solutions or strategies quickly while we wait to get our singing sensation in place. One is that adolescents living in poverty-stricken areas or societies where we have issues in terms of access to services and goods and the nine yards, they are less likely to obtain free contraceptives and other family planning services. Sexual abuse is another issue that not only exacerbates the problem, but also shrouds the problem. So how do we engage? How do we engage? We engage by ensuring that we work collectively as a team to look at what the resources are that we can garner to allow for making sure that the persons who have been interrupted, their pregnancy has interrupted their schooling, that they're able to find resources to continue and to be productive citizens. There are so many success stories we've had. And so at this point, I want to introduce Candy. She is Camilla, Camilla Candy Isaacs, singing sensation. And she is going to now belt out as she would normally do a very inspirational piece that would allow for persons who are victims of um, gender-based violence, persons who have had pregnancy, persons who are feeling depressed, people, persons who need hope, who need inspiration to get that from her as she shares with you now a very inspirational piece. Illusions that can change the world Trapped inside an ordinary girl She looks just like me Too afraid to dream out loud And though it's set for your ideas It won't make sense to everybody you need courage now if you're gonna persevere yeah you gotta answer when you're called so don't be afraid to face the world against all odds keep the dream alive don't let it if something deep inside keeps inspiring you to try, don't stop and never give up. Don't ever give up on you. Don't give up. Every victory comes in time. Work today to change tomorrow. It gets easier. Who's to say that you can't fly? And every step will take you there, closer to your destination. You need courage now. And you see you're almost there. Oh, 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 you gotta answer when you're called. So don't be afraid to face the world against the odds. Keep the dream alive, don't let it die. If something deep inside keeps inspiring you to try, don't stop and never give up. Don't ever give up on you. 
sometimes life can place a stumbling block in your way but you gotta keep the faith bring what's deep inside your heart to the light and never give up don't ever give up on you who holds the pieces to complete the puzzle the answer that can solve all mysteries the keys that can unlock your understanding it's all inside of you you have everything you need so keep the dream alive don't let it die it's something deep inside keeps inspiring you to try don't stop and never give up don't ever give up on you sometimes life can place a stumbling block in your way but you gotta keep the faith bring what's deep inside your heart your heart to the light and never give up don't ever give up on you no Wow. I know you are giving her a round of applause to so keep the applause going. You know, there are so many things that can be inspired us to say, to do, keep the dream alive. Don't let it die. Don't ever give up. Keep the fight. Whatever comes in your way, whatever comes in your heart, don't give up. Keep the fight, keep pushing and keep it going. I see some very important persons who have joined our session. And while I give a general welcome, just adding to what our chair had done initially, where she welcomed you all, I also want to give a special welcome to Miss Jeanette James from Grenada. I also want to highlight Joyce Alfonsi from Suriname. Thank you so much. And there are so many other persons who have also joined. I see that you are lighting up the chat. It's looking very robust already. And I can see that persons are enjoying what is happening. I thank you so much. I'm happy that you are here. I expected no less. I know that you're looking forward to our keynote speaker or, or lecturer, actually, who is going to be the person giving this lecture for this fourth Hamela Matney lecture. So at this point, I wish to ask, for Ms. Abigail Carr, Human Resource Manager, Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, to introduce our lecturer, our guest lecturer at this point. Are you ready, Ms. Carr? Sure am. Thank okay, you so right much, ahead. Mrs. Robinson. I have the special privilege of introducing to you formally our presenter for today. So the Pamela McNeil Lecture focuses on public awareness in relation to adolescent pregnancy, its effect, psychosocial support needs, mitigating solutions. And this year, it's no different. The theme that has been aptly chosen is adolescent pregnancy, breaking the cycle, protecting our girls. To ensure the foundation achieves its focus this year and every other year that we've had so far, we partner with dynamic field specialists. And this year, it's exceptionally no difference. Today, we will have Professor Opal Palma Adisa, who is a gender specialist, a cultural activist, a writer, and who is also the former university director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at the UWI. 
Professor Adisa believes that literature and performance arts are some of the best approaches to interrogate gender inequality and formulate an approach for gender justice. She is someone that is passionate about the work she does. She's a, female, she's a feminist and an activist for over four decades and has published over 20 collections that includes essays, novels, short stories, poetry, and children's books. Her area of focus are usually on gender-based violence, ending child abuse, whether physical or sexual, and her essays, stories, and poems and articles are usually surrounding this particular topic. She has over 400 publications. She has recently also completed the children's biography of Portia Simpson Miller, entitled Portia's Dream, Jamaica's first prime minister, female prime minister, and is also the editor for 100 Voices for Miss Lou, which is a poetry tribute and interviews and essay collection. You see our presenter is here to share her wealth of knowledge as we embark on ensuring that we learn how to break the cycle and protect our girls. I know that you have been waiting for her and she's here to share with you. So as we go through it today, remember, get your notepads out because there's, there'll be a lot for you to jot down as we learn about how to break the cycle and protect our girls. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Is everyone seeing and hearing me? I just want to say hello. How excited I am to be here. I want to thank the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation for the formidable work that you have been doing and will continue to do to help make sure that our girls who slip, who make a, have a mistake or whatever, that they have an opportunity to rewrite and realign and re-enter the community. And this is really very important to us. So I have a lot to say and I will go very quickly, but I also will be doing three surveys because it's important that I exchange with you. I also invite you to put your comments and your questions in the chat and hopefully we will get to that. I have a PowerPoint that I'll be sharing. and. You know, as was said in my bio, one of the things that I understand and that I know is that we have to deal with this subject both from the empirical in terms of research, but also from the emotional level. And we have to look at that each of us contribute. We are all part of the society and each of us contribute to the society. So without further ado, I want to thank you and um, welcome all of you who are here and let's just get right into it. So I'm going to be sharing my PowerPoint and I share we practiced this before so um, we should be and then I think let's see um, I go to play slide and that should be it all right excellent is everyone seeing just indicate in the chat or something because I'm no longer seeing you and I also want to say that for me you know I'm very much engaged by people and so it's it's a little unfortunate that I'm not seeing you and you are we're working in this virtual space which is what COVID-19 has done with us but that I long and I hope we'll have an opportunity to um engage so adolescent pregnancy breaking the cycle protecting our girls let's just get right into it um so what is adolescent pregnancy and you know i was given this topic and i want to say full disclosure that my older sister became pregnant uh when she was at that time it was o levels in uh fifth four and it was a devastating moment for our family so I, 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 you know, I, I, I often don't share that, but I think it's important that we share that and what that meant for me and what that meant for my family. So what is adolescent pregnancy, pregnancy when we hear about that? Pregnancy is girls between the ages of 11 to 18. Now I want you, as I'm going through this presentation, to reflect on your age back then. I want you to reflect, if you can, for those of you who are not adolescent, of what it was you were doing at 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17. You know, what were you doing at that time? What do you remember about yourself? Well, at 11, I got my first period and I was terrified, even though I had 
somewhat had a little preparation before. So just imagine what that means for someone who is 11, you know, and this year, the youngest uh, person who has been enrolled um, in the program is an 11 year old. I can't imagine um, what I was be thinking or doing at that time. And something is happening with my slide, which I don't know why, okay. So teen pregnancy is a result of early sexual activity, forced or unforced. But I want to tell you guys, and it's probably something that many of you know, most is unforced, right? Lack of basic knowledge about the body and how one can become pregnant. I'm actually always amazed when I speak to young girls and they say to me, well, then tell me if we did stand up and do it, I couldn't get pregnant. Somehow the information, the factual information is not being uh relate to them and we have to really make sure that girls understand their body and what happens or what that there are many ways one can become pregnant and standing up by a tree is not one of those um as was mentioned lack of access to and use of contraceptive and i will go into this a little later but we have to stop being hypocritical if we give access to contraceptive it's not that we're endorsing sex we are knowing that children have been and will continue uh to have sex whether we say so or not so the most we could do to prevent is to make sure that they have access to something that would uh help them not to become pregnant and lack of access to abortion which again is another controversy but that is something part of the mix so we need to be aware of it right a lot of girls in talking to them um, had a really poor or a low self-esteem not all but many do and that also impacts why they become pregnant how then do we break the cycle of teenage pregnancy First of all, we need to know what a cycle is. A cycle is a series of events that are regularly repeated in the same order. And if we look at the data in Jamaica, we see that teenage pregnancy is not new and that it now has become intergenerational. And that is where part of the danger lies, not just for the women, but for our entire society. And we'll look at that as we get there, right? So we want to be sure, how do we protect our girls? And why do we need to protect our girls? Well, one of the best ways to protect anyone is to give them information and to let them know what are some of the potential threats or harm that they're faced in. And we need to protect our girls because our data in Jamaica about child abuse, sexual abuse of girls is alarming. It is an epidemic like COVID, and we really need to understand that it does. it's, it's about all of us. You know, this whole notion of a village that we have, that needs to become real again. And we need to look at why is it that that has been interrupted and how do we mend that? Because unless we can mend this whole notion of a village, then our girls are not protected. We have to look at our various communities and neighborhood and to see what kinds of systems and structures need to be put in place so that our girls are protected. Now, I interviewed a number of girls and it was based on an interview of one of these girls that I have written this poem, which is very emotional. And I want you to listen to it keenly. And again, I want you to reflect on your own selves at 13. What were you doing? What were you thinking? What were you feeling? It is such a, this period is so fraught with mixed emotions and, you know, self of what is yourself. You're trying to be a woman, but you're not quite. I remember my mother telling me at 13, you might think you have a woman body, but you're still a child. And I was so glad she said that and reminded me of that, that I was a child. Because of course, when your body begins to do this thing that you don't even understand, you might begin to think you're a little woman. So here goes. Or did I go, did I not do this? Okay. She is not yet 13, a child. Her life is crumpled shard. You step over and around. She is not yet 13, a girl you see on the street, her eyes to the ground, a mound at her stomach. Why is she not in school? You kiss your teeth, speak with disdain loud enough for she and others to hear. I'm tired of them little gal pick me, picking up woman ways. Just watch her belly and bet she can't even read. If there was a stone in reach, you would have picked it up and tossed it at her. 
She is not yet 13. A child, a girl child. You don't ask who put that baby in your belly. You don't ask, how can I help you? You don't go and haul or curse or kiss your teeth at the boy or man who raped her. Yes, rape. She is not yet 16. She is not yet 13. You watched her grow in the community, shook your head when you noticed buds on her chest and her buttocks raised the back of her skirt. You knew danger was lurking, but you didn't warn her. You didn't tell the men and the boys to leave her alone. You turned a blind eye and kept walking. She is not yet 13, a girl, a child. You heard the whispers in the community, how her father was messing with her, how she was always jumping into taxi and guessing money for allowing men to touch the her, how her mother sent her to bring back bread without money. Just let him touch you, no harm in that. You said nothing. You did not report it. She is not yet 13, a girl frightened and shame, a girl that has been tossed around and abused, a girl whose mother and community use her as a bait to wet their frustration. But she's our 13 year old, a sister, a cousin, daughter, niece, a member of our society who is being silenced and abused under our watch, just a 13 year old girl. A little girl with a belly. And it's important that we remember that because one of the consistent things that young girls that I interview and evil people who have grown up, one of the consistent things they talk about is the way the community and family members were completely against them. Not in all cases, there were lots who were pr protected and pr um, supported, but many walking around the community, how people talked about them. One girl talked about how when she went into labor, how the nurse treated her, which was horrendous and unethical. You know, and we tend in our society to blame the victim. But what creates this victim? This, these young girls. Jamaica has the third highest adolescent pregnancy rate in Latin America and the Caribbean region. This is an epidemic. Why is that? What are we doing about that? Right? 50% of Jamaican girls' first sexual experience is forced or unwanted. So here is the crux of the matter, my people, and which is why we need to work to end this. 50%, and I suspect it's low. I suspect it's probably as high as 70% because there was another study that was done more recently where women were interviewed and, and I think it was 70% of them who first sexual experience were forced or unwanted. What does that mean? It means we are not teaching our girls how to say no. It means we are not providing a system that protects our girls. It means that our girls are prey and men and boys feel that they can force themselves onto them whether they want it or not and leave them to shoulder the blame. This is an outrageous statistic for any society, but it is particularly outrageous for Jamaica that 50% of our girls' first sexual experience is forced or unwanted. Because what that says is that sex is a terror that their first sexual experience being unwanted mean that it is painful, meaning that it is brutal, meaning there is no regard for them and there's no level of pleasure involved. We have to change that. We absolutely must change that. And okay, what does this data tell us? And what is it that we, you know, why are these girls getting pregnant? Well, the data tells us very clearly why they're getting pregnant, because sex is being forced onto them. Now, what the data often doesn't tell us, and this will come at my end, is who is impregnating these girls. That is important data, and this brings in a whole level of legality and moral and ethical responsibility, not just on the part of 
families and girls, but on the part of the government in terms of how we protect our girls. So at this point, JIS is going to give you a quick survey, which to do, um, because for me, this is very important and make sure it, it ensures that you are involved. So are they getting this? I'm not sure. So the first question is, when I see a pregnant teen, my first response is empathy, disgust, concern, indifference. Be truthful. I don't know who you are, but I need to know because this will help me in analyzing and help me in terms of looking at the cultural nuances that impacts um, child, adolescent pregnancy. Uh, so I'm assuming that the survey is being shared and uh, you are answering these questions. Question two, uh, the major cause of teenage pregnancy is, and I'm always surprised when I get the data, the promiscuous girl, girls, rape, incest, consent. What do you think is a major cause of teenage pregnancy in Jamaica? that the girls are promiscuous, that there's rape involved, incest or consent, okay? Next question. Teen mothers largely come from, and where do you think teen mothers come from? Low income homes, fatherless homes, meaning there's no father or man in the home, girls who don't live with either parents, girls who lack self-esteem. And it might be one or more, but the one that you think is dominant in terms of where do you think these teen mothers largely come from, okay? And then I think this is the fourth and final question, and then I will go on with my presentation. Teen pregnancy is largely the responsibility of parents, of the government, of the community, or all of the above. So what do you think? That teen pregnancy is larger the responsibility of just the parents, the government, the community, or all of the above. So I hope you participated in the survey and that will be uh, tallied and hopefully shared at some point. So many of you are very much familiar with Dr. Shivan News. And in speaking about the negative impact of the COVID pandemic, she says, outside of the protective environment provided by schools, many girls are more susceptible to adolescent pregnancy and gender-based violence. So there are two things here I want you to consider and to look at. The protective environment, that school has been a safe house for girls, and for two years, many of them don't have that safe house. And that they are subjected to gender-based violence. And we know that I Divorce is coming up next week, which focuses on gender, how to end gender-based violence. So this already tells us something culturally that is relevant, that we live in an environment where our girls don't necessarily have safety in the home or in the community, and that they are the subject of gender-based violence. So this should alert us to some of the things that we need to do to correct these issues. For the, for the uh, three year period from 2010 to 2013, the Registrar General Department recorded a total of 1,360 live births for teenagers between the ages of 11 and 15. <laughs> and I want to point out, excuse me? Yeah, I want to point out that again, this data is underrepresented. So there are in fact more than 1,364 births. Let's look at the Women's Center Jamaica Foundation and their enrollment. So, and I, and I, and I, will, and I want us to look at a few very key points. So here we see from 2016 that the enrollment figure was 1,264. And today, to date, um, it's 799. Now that would indicate that the figures have gone down, but those figures only indicate the enrollment. It does not, uh, it is not a true or a total representation of the number of adolescents who are pregnant and who are currently pregnant in the society, right? Also, I want us to look at total amount of rape. If the average age of the girl is 16, then the figures on rape is inaccurate. Now, why is it that most girls are unwilling, are unable to name rape? Because rape is not something that we've explained in our society to our girls. So even though it might be forced, 
right? And we know that based on the data before that much of this is forced, then it is technically rape if they are 16 and under. But they, and if it's done by um, a man or a boy who is more than 16 or, 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 or over. So the, the data on rape is not accurate, but we see that we had one in 2017, nine in 2018, 13 and so forth, right? Now here is why it is important that we protect our girls and give them the necessary information and support that they need. Whereas in 216, and it would seem that there isn't a great deal of uh, second pregnancies, we see that there are second pregnancies that have occurred, right? And we, I would like to think that, uh, and this again is only based on the clientele of the Women's Center, uh, Center, right? But one of the things that we know from research and from data is that many teens who get pregnant under age teens, then they are more likely to have one or two children if they do not get the kind of help and guidance that they need. What is the implication for their education system? The numbers are very low really in terms of those who are enrolled in skill or tertiary education um, institutions, because we know that in order for our society to develop, we need um, people who are skilled advanced to high school. So the data there is not terrible, but it's not great. It should be at least 50% or higher. I think that what we want to do, we want to look at how do we work to ensure that at least 80% of our girls complete high school. And so far the data is saying this is not necessarily happening. But I also think that this category gave up their baby for adoption is very telling about Jamaica. And what it says is that despite the challenges that many girls have, they keep their baby. Despite the fact that many of them are raped, they keep their babies. Despite the fact that the community uh, ignores them and maligns them, they keep their babies. So it speaks to their humanity. It speaks to their resilience. It speaks to their hopefulness. This for me is the best data that I've gotten, you know, in terms of that. And then, of course, we see that not as many uh, reside with their baby fathers. So we want to make sure that we look at what that means and how that can be, um, how that figure can be um, elevated. So who are these girls who are and why are they getting pregnant? Many, as I said before, are victims of sexual abuse and incest, very high in Jamaica. And we really need to work together to ensure that we deal with sexual abuse and incest. Um, some are having sex at a young age. And part of that is cultural. And we need to look at the culture that says, boy, you need to be a big woman and you need to have sex and you need to have sex with a big man. Uh, there are instances of drug and, drugs and alcoholic use. And we need to look more at that. Frequent family issues and poor communications. Uh, many of the girls I interviewed talked about you know, wanting someone to talk to. Initially, these men, these older men, seemed like they were um, there for them, would listen to them, and then it turned into sexual. So the need for communication, need for the family to engage these girls, and some lack of goals for a variety of reasons. So these are some of the underlying reasons why girls are getting pregnant, right? And many lack knowledge about sex and contraception. And in this day and age, this should not be the case. And we in Jamaica really need to do better to make sure that our girls have the proper knowledge about sex and contraception and that, you know, what they can get pregnant at the first time. And many of them do. Um, and aware, uh, aware of the rise in teenage pregnancy, the government of Jamaica has committed $7.9 million on the technical support to reduce teenage pregnancy project during the 20. 121 22 fiscal years and so the objectives is to contribute to the reduction of adolescent pregnancy rates in jamaica to impact in adolescent sexual and reproductive health behavior change among boys as well as girls to increase public awareness of the adolescent sexual and reproductive health issues and to increase access to sexual and re reproductive health and these are really important particularly in inner cities particularly in rural areas how do we get and if the curriculum is not providing 
in the kind of information that our girls need? How do we ensure that they do that? Right? That's also very important. Okay, so reporting in the Gleaner just recently on May 15th, we got that teen problem. Teen pregnancy is a public health issue. Um, that by this is by Patricia Watson. Um, go ahead, slide. Um, and of the 42,161 babies born in Jamaica, um, 6,138 were the first born for teenagers aged 15 to 19. 6,138. And again, we know that we still have a lot of people who cover it up, send their kids to the country, don't report it, keep them inside, all kinds of stuff. So again, this data, if we were to get accurate data, would probably increase substantially. Um, off of that, 1,178 were recorded as second births for the same age group. So we need to do better at that. It's much better at third births, 121, 10 or fourth, fourth births, and one for fifth and sixth birth. So we have to make sure that we reach these girls at whatever stage, at whatever level, and provide them with the proper information to ensure that this does not continue. Because what we know happens is that it produces a cycle of poverty. Jamaicans are very fertile. The fertile rate for girls age 15 to 19 remains one of the highest in the Caribbean. Uh, 59 per 1,000 for girls, and then Belize and Guyana leaves that. Must be the good food we're eating, right? The yam and banana that they say the athletes eat, and the ackee and the sawfish, um, why the fertility rate is there. And so there's nothing wrong with the fertility rate is, is how it gets uh, reproduced. So why do we need to protect our girls? Because their health impacts. Um, and the health impacts are, come on, you're supposed to, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, the health impacts uh, are, are many, and sometimes, again, we don't think about that. So the maternal mortality rate for teenagers and uh, teen pregnancies higher, premature newborns, labor complications, low birth weight, low and poor diet, and poor living conditions. And I'm not sure why these other slides are over here um, and not showing up on the column as they should. And so you are unable to see that. But it also talks about the psychological impact that happens to girls. Um, all right, so let's hope that this doesn't continue with the slide platform here. Um, so profile of teen mothers. At this point, I had interviewed a teen very recently and I had wanted to share her uh, interview with you because I thought it was very poignant. Unfortunately, the volume is very low. But one of the things this young mother said, uh, several things she said, but one is when she became pregnant, her boyfriend, she was almost 17 and her boyfriend was 20. And one of the most devastating things for her, and it was split between her family, she was living in an extended family, half of the people supported her, but um, including her mother, but other people, uncles and even aunts were very antagonistic and disappointed. But what for her was most um, tragic was that her baby's father said it wasn't his child. And in fact, did not accept the child until after the child was born and there was a DNA paternity test done. And so she went through tremendous depression, uh, tried to abort the baby several times, and um, just she was just very overwhelmed. So at this time, we have a second survey, teen mother survey, um, and the results, host and panelists can't vote. Why is that? OK, host and panel. This was to have been put up before. And so right now, we're actually be going, should be moving on to um, the other survey. But since it's just now being put up, please, those of you who are here, and we have 106 people, participants, yay, Women's Center Foundation, please do the survey now, right? Um, it's just being shared. So please do the survey now. Um, this data is going to be very helpful for me in terms of being able to offer more analysis to both the cultural and social perception of teen mothers and what we think are the causes and how to make sure that we get to the public uh, the profile of teen mothers and we also get to the public um, you know what are some of the variables that impact and um, have 
precedence on terms of teen mothers. So I want to thank you for doing that. As I said, um, the audio is not available, so um, we'll go on. So this is when you should, yeah, this, this, this was the first survey, um, which was to have been done, and then now you should be showing the second survey. What we can reduce teen pregnancy by insisting that girls do not have sex until marriage, right? Or there it is, educating and demanding that boys and men take responsibility providing accurate information in schools about sex and contraception, and ensuring that uh, more measures to protect girls are in, in, in our society. Question two, teen pregnancy in viewed, is viewed in our society as a form of A, passage to womanhood. I got a lot of that, I was, just, yeah. Uh, a lot of people said expand the population, some said it's sex punishment for early sexual activity and uh, uh, bad be girl behavior. Um, so these are attitudes, societal attitudes that we have to tackle. And teen mothers, do you believe that teen mothers should be supported financially to complete their education? What are the other questions? Um, I, I can't see it. So just continue to fill those out. And we will go on um, in a few, well, a minute. I'm just going through. Um, so teen mothers should be supported financially to complete their education, be sent to group homes, be required to reveal who and when they became impregnated, and be provided with contraception after giving birth. And I think the Women's Center does that. So we already have some proactive actions uh, that are taking place. And what are the profile of a teen mother? An easy or fast or easy girl with boys or men, uh, lacks ambition, uh, has no goals, all of the above. All right. So now this is where it's important when we talk about protecting and changing attitudes, we want to look at the intergenerational impact, right? Because this has to do with our development in our society, teen pregnancy, the impact. So mothers and older sisters are the main sources of family influence on teenage pregnancy. And this is due to both social risk and social influence. So, you know, you go to the doctor and they say, do you, what illnesses do you have in your family on your mother's side, on your father's side? Well, the data is suggesting that teen pregnancy is uh, aligned to what happens with mothers and sisters for girls. And family members both contribute to an individual's attitude and values around teenage pregnancy and share social risks such as poverty, ethnicity, and lack of opportunities that influence the likelihood of teenage pregnancy. So it has been found, it is not conclusive, having an older sister who was a teen mom significantly increases the risk of teenage childbearing in the younger sisters and daughter right and teenage mothers um converse, conversations when we're not having that we need to have is teenagehood is puberty is a flood of hormones experience much of us we can't experience i mean we experience but we don't understand again i always want you to step in the shoes of these young people and if you could remember yourself at 12, 13, 14, 15, and the rush of emotions and things that were going on with you, right? Strong emotion and sexual feelings that you don't understand because oftentimes there is not this plain conversation with it. So you don't know what you should do and your friends don't know either and they give you a lot of wrong information. And if you rely on the media, you get conflicting information, right? So there's general confusion and conflicting feelings that appear invasive at times. You're feeling in your body and desires that you don't know how to explain. So schools need to help to develop honest, basic courses on human relationships that include sexuality. That's one measure to really help to stem teenage pregnancy. Because while it's good for us to provide resources for them after the fact, we want to make sure they don't get pregnant in the first place. We need to talk about seduction. 
you know how men say our voices if you love me you will give me some you know we need to talk about the need for attention a lot of young girls particularly young girls who don't have positive men or fathers in their life there's a need for atten attention and healthy touching we need to be able to do that and establish that and once we're able to do that and establish that it will reduce it because a lot of the young girls I talked to they just wanted someone to talk to they just wanted to feel good and feel love and some man who understands how to manipulate the emotion say to them well baby you know I love you and if you love me so obviously what we're saying let me go back very quickly I'm sorry obviously it takes um uh, you know oh I'm doing something that I don't want to do I just want to do that um it, we must understand that the solution is not singular, that it is multifaceted, and that this work is continuous. It's not something that, you know, we just do a quick fix and then happen. And it's the responsibility of everybody working in concert, the responsibility of families, of schools, of the communities, of the government, okay? Uh, consequences of teenage pregnancy, nearly one third of teen girls who have dropped out of high school cite early pregnancies. Uh, pregnancy or parenthood as a key reason and only 40 percent now while this data is uh pertinent to the usa it's also pertinent to us right those who have baby before age finish the who finish uh who don't finish college or stuff so here are some of the larger implications people which is where now we really need to work the developmental factors the social factor the educational factor the health and the economic factors Developmentally as a society, if women constitute 50, 49 or 51 percent of the population and a large percentage of those women are uneducated and have early ch children and therefore lack of skills and resources to provide them, then the, 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 the developmental factor is, is, is evident that we cannot develop as fast as a society because we don't have the full workforce engaged to do that. The social implications are numerous, and there are many researches that have been done on children from teenagers who don't have the um, financial or social support in terms of um, hospitalization, in terms of health, in terms of lack of care, in terms of going to schools. The educational impact is not just on the mother, but is on the child. So the larger developmental factor is crucial and of course the economic factor we already have data to Jamaica and the world that single mothers and I hate that term because it's a misnomer and I talk about that a little later that um, are economically uh, poorer than um, others so teenage pregnancy study done I think I uh, I have to rush because um, I'm probably in my time uh, not just yet uh, what is what's going on here sometimes this doesn't work as well as it should um so i just want to go through some things very quickly before we close that we get to the other survey study done um by planned parenthood in the usa offers these findings which i think are relevant to us and which we can pay attention to in general teenage mothers do not fare well as their peers who delay childbearing their family incomes are lower they're more likely to be poor and receive uh, public assistance they're less educated and they're less likely to be married, right? So that's a, a study. And then there's more data, the children of teenage parents, which I found very, again, this is not exclusive and there's exception to the rule, but it does show, it does give us caution, right? The children of teenage parents lag in standards of early development. Um, so that's something for us to be aware of, face severe health, economic and social consequences because pregnant teens are less likely to receive adequate prenatal care, and we know that to be true, are 25% more likely to have preterm birth and are 18% more likely to be low birth um, and are more likely to have childhood health problems, right? And so the risk um, more likely to be abused or neglected those of women than those of women who delay childbearing receive uh, poor nutritional health, cognitive and social stimulation, tend to live in poverty, greater risk of social behavior, lower intellectual and academic achievement, half times as likely to be incarcerated, less likely to graduate from high school because of the social and economic conditions under which they're living. So are these variables relevant to us in Jamaica? Absolutely. 
if a similar portrayal applies, how does it impact our future as a nation and what role can we play in the global market? Does it expand or curtail our abilities and opportunity? Is this just a their issue or an our issue? And how do we help to change things? Which is really what I want to go into. Basic right of a teen mother, pregnant teenagers have the right to stay in school. This was not always the case. Thank you so much, Women Center. Um, so you can, uh, you, you, women, girls now have the right, still some are not aware of this, but you have the right to take, to, to stay in school, um, to have time off for prenatal visits, for abo um, abortion care or other health reasons. These are now available to all Jamaican girls, regardless of where you are, regardless of the circumstances um, under which you got pregnant. I am seeing that the first survey, and I want to thank you. So we see that 34% were empath had empathy. Um, no percent had discussed. Thank you so much. I'm looking at a very um, enlightened group here. 66% percent offer a concern, and there was no indifference. Wonderful. And then the major cause of teen pregnancy, 13% um, said promiscuity. 47% said um, uh, uh, rape and for some reason it's not oh yeah there and uh, incest 31 percent and nine percent said consent so this is really great data teen pregnancy is largely responsibility 13 percent say parents nobody said the government or the community and eight oh well 88 percent said all of them both thank you I'm not reading this correctly and let me just quickly uh, the major cause of teen prom, um, pregnancy is uh, promiscuity no, we did that already. All right, so this is great. Thank you so much for participating. Um, so let me continue because I know I have to rush. So we know that the Women's Center um, of Jamaica Foundation in 1978 and it has helped many girls stay in school. Now here are some cultural factors and teenage pregnancy, which is where we need to get. We wanna go about solution. So addressing teenage pregnancy using a cultural lens is important in a setting where culture can conceal a considerable amount even from its own members. And this was a study that was done on Jamaica specifically, right? And it's, so it's important that we use that. We wanna shift the gaze, people. Uh, most times we think of teenage pregnancy and we never factor in the fathers or the men. Teenage pregnancy involves both girls. This is an important study that was done in South Africa and which I think can be very informative to us and a similar study should be done in Jamaica. Teenage pregnancy involves both boys and girl and her male partner and the characteristics of these young men could be a fundamental underlying factor in teenage pregnancy which should not be ignored. Teenage pregnancy is often described and analyzed as being a female adolescent problem. Hello, we are shifting the gaze. It is not a female adolescent problem. It is a female and a male adolescent problem. Okay, knowledge of the characteristics of young men who engage in sex with teenagers could prevent susceptibility of adolescent girls to unwanted sex and help to create a lasting solution to unplanned pregnancy, which is where we want to be. We want to have unplanned pregnancy. Reducing teenage pregnancy has been a topical focus on the development agenda for decades. And in South Africa, more than 30% of teenage girls fall pregnant. So their data is just a little, uh oh, what's happening here? It's just a little below us. Local initiatives to address teenage pregnancy include the men as partner program. And I want to, um, Mrs. Colburn is on here, and I, I really want to encourage her to encourage the minister who is very supportive of this to look at a similar program that South Africa has implemented called Men as Partners to reduce teenage pregnancy. Um, and this is, this is a very important, exciting study that was done. I want to offer something that I have done, which is called Positive Fatherhood, which is a workbook that I've developed for teenage boys. And I'm developing a similar book for teenage girls. And this was done as a result of a UNESCO grant that the Institute got that I led and um, produced this book. And what it does is it provides young men with the opportunity to be reflective, to think, to, to, to look at their feelings and to talk about why they want to have a child before they have a child. And I think a similar kind of 
workbook ought to be developed for girls. So uh, I want young men to think about what are the good qualities of a mother? What type of relationship do they have with their father? And what kind of relationship do they want to have with um, their, their, what kind of relationship they would want their, their, their child, their future child to have with them. So this book is simply a guide for us to look at, um, for men to begin to take responsibility and for them to understand. So we have to look at fatherhood and what is being modeled in our society, what types of fatherhood are being mod modeled and, um, how is that being amplified? We find that fathers, here's another important study that I looked at from the University of Michigan, we find that fathers of pregnancies are older and less educated than non-pregnant women partners and the intimate relationships are serious, unstable and conflictual. It is the oldest and least educated partners who father their pregnancy. Men who are raping girls, right? Findings from the Planned Parenthood studies, teenage girls with older partners are more likely to become pregnant than those with partners closer to age. Who would have thought, right? So these older men are not using contraceptive. They're technically raping the girls and uh, because of their own ego and for other reasons, right? A study found that 6.7% of women aged 15 to 17 have partners six or more years older than they are. And the pregnancy rate for this group is 3.7 times as high as the rate for those whose partner is two age or less. So we want to begin to encourage young girls to not, if they're going to have sex or whatever, not to look to older men. And I know that a lot of times they look to older men because that is some of pride in the society. It's a cultural marker if you have a big man, so to speak, but they're more likely to get pregnant and more likely to be abused as a result of that, right? So this is the third and last survey. And then I come to my final knock in terms of what do we do to um, ensure and to reduce teenage pregnancy. So together we can reduce teenage pregnancy. How do we do that? By setting high standards for boys and girls. Um, and here, there is a survey reporting incidents, incest and rape. People, I need your help. We all need your help. Incest and rape has to be reported. It is grossly underreported. And 90% of the time we know it's happening and what's going on. So we have to take responsibility and own us for what's happening with our girls. And we know that we have to work to help provide and protect them. Teaching sexual and reproductive health in schools, all of the above. Teen pregnancy must make males as accountable as girls hello underline underscore make males as accountable as girls so stop this notion that teenage pregnancy is a female issue it is not people it is not require financial and emotional support from boys and men the government has to do this but this should be mandatory change older charge older men who impregnate uh, on the age girls, we're not doing that. So they continue to do it. They impregnate one girl and the girl doesn't say anything or the mother or the community and they go on and they impregnate another girl. We have to stop that by making them understand that it's a crime and that they are fined and charged, right? And um, what is the pledge? Because I don't want you to just be on and be like motivated and ah, I feel great. I want you to do something. So what pledge can you make or are you willing to make to help change this issue? So you are going to be an advocate for teen mothers. I don't know what that looks like, but they need more advocates. And you could figure that out or you could call the Women's Center or other places to figure out what that looks like and how you can advocate. But the simplest way you can advocate is by being aware. The simplest way you can advocate is by speaking out when you see these men on the street talking about these young girls. The, the, the simple way you can advocate is when you see these girls and you see them giggling because, you know, girls, when somebody say, oh, you're so cute, you can say to them, hey, I've been there. It ain't about you being cute. It's about them trying to get in your pants and you don't need to let that happen because the consequences are far more. So um, these are some of the practical things you can do. Please do them. We need your help. We need your support. We need to end this epidemic and it's going to take all of us. And now I'm coming to my last two final slides after the survey. Um, and I want to thank you for participating. So, you know, you're pledging to be an advocate. You are being more mindful of the factors that contribute to teenage pregnancy. You're educating your colleagues, your church, your organizations on the plight of teen mothers. 
and you're providing financial assistance to support keep mothers in whatever way you can. Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health has created a program towards the reduction of teen pregnancy, um, which involves sensitization, such as offering sessions for healthcare workers in targeted parishes under the reduction of teenage pregnancy project. Again, a lot of our teens and some mothers of teens are not aware of these programs. So one of the way you can advocate is by making sure you provide them with the resources that are available to them, because uh, it might seem that people know, but a lot of times people don't know what more can and needs to be done. So this is where the, um, the, the, what they say, the shoe make the pavement or something. Um, we must integrate and veil, break the veil of protection that teen mothers, their family and the community use to protect men. I am just dismayed at this, why girls don't want to identify the men, the parents, the community. We protect these predators and we must stop. We absolutely must stop protecting these predators because they do it to one teen girl and they do it to six. It is a crime. It is dangerous. We have to stop. Men and boys must be called out and legally required to be responsible. Um, all men between the ages of 18 to 100 who are found to have sex with a minor, which means a child under the age of 16, technically it is rape, must be prosecuted, must undergo therapy, and after release must be required to assist with the financial support of said child until the age of 18. This for me is number one and number two, these are the crux of the matter. That until men are prosecuted, until men undergo therapy, because they obviously need therapy, this is not going to stop. We can have all the programs to help the mothers, but we don't want to be able to, we don't want to help teenage mothers be more effective at being mothers. We want to help them continue to stay in school and not be the victims of predators. And so we have to, we have to create measures that's going to stop that before it happens. You don't wait until the house burned down to have a um, fire extinguisher and fire alarm in your house. If you are proactive, you make sure you have those things. All known incest abusers must be outed, prosecuted, and required to undergo therapy. So for me, therapy is essential. I don't just want to throw away people because that doesn't work, right? So just like how girls need therapy, men need therapy because they've been trained and oriented to believe that they have a right to girls and women and they can just drop their seeds wherever they want and we know that this is no longer acceptable should never have been acceptable in to begin with and so we want to give them therapy we want to have an educated healthy society and that's the only way we can have an educated healthy society and we want to stop um, um sex so we break the cycle by being honest not turning a blind eye, embracing every child as our own, being a true village, naming, identifying, and reporting predators before they pray, before they pray, calling out older men who pray on underage minor girls, honestly educating our girls about their body, uh, about sex, feelings, and emotion, educating and drilling the responsibility of all boys and men. So the misnomer for me is single parent. All children come into the world as a result of two parents. So this notion that we celebrate single parent needs to end and needs to stop. And um, I have said my spiel. I want to thank you for listening. I hope you have found it to be uh, informative and engaging. And I want us all to have a very successful life. I want us to be our sister's keeper. I want us to be our sister's keeper. I want us to protect young girls and ensure that they don't get pregnant. But if they do, we want to provide them with all of the resources, the emotional, the psychological, and other resources that are available to them so that they continue to complete their education, continue to get necessary skills so that their lives are improved and the lives of their children are improved. Thank you so much. So I don't know what's in the chat. There seems to be a lot in the chat. Um, and um, Mrs. Uh, Corbin Robinson, will there be an opportunity for questions and answer? Q&A? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
So I just want to use this opportunity to say thank you so much, Prof, for really pulling away the curtains. You have given us so much food for thought. There has been so much information, statistics, strategies. I think there is so much that has been said, so much information that I think some persons are, they might be hearing some of these things for the first time. And I like the fact that you talked about just naming and shaming and not having that crowd, that, that cloud of secrecy and that conspiracy of silence, which many, in many cases shows what is happening and cause persons to not come forward with the information and not to seek assistance. Now, I know that persons are rearing to speak and perhaps they might have questions that you want, they want to ask, questions they want to raise, comments they want to make. And I think at this point, I'm going to open the floor to persons. I'm not seeing hands raised, but um, I'm not sure if persons have questions they want to ask. And then when we do the question and answer, then I have a few just broad strokes I want to, to make in terms of summary and perhaps to make some suggestions because you raised some issues as well as possibilities, some areas you think the government should take on. So I wanted to shed some light on that and perhaps just have a conversation about that as well. So the floor is now open. So if persons want to uh, say their bit, there is your chance. Who wants to go first? Can they unmute? I don't know if the system allows them to unmute and to raise a question or a comment, you know. Um, I think so. And I just want people to know that I am working on a book where we're interviewing a colleague and I, uh, Karen Lee, um, who's at UWE at the library. We're working on a book. We're interviewing um, successful teen mothers because we think this is important for um, some of the young girls who are now experiencing this, that they understand that it's not the end of the road. And uh, again, I can't give enough kudos to the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, who has been doing a formidable job uh, to help our girls and we um, we guide them into um, education and to complete their their goals and uh, take care of their, 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 their babies. I think I've heard, thank you so much, Prof. I've heard, uh, I think I see a hand for Crystal. I'm not sure if she wants to say something. Crystal, what's her name? Swaby. Um, are you able to open your mic, Crystal? Can you try? Because I see your hands. I'm not sure if you wanted to say something at this point. No, sorry. I didn't want to say anything. So there's a question from Rowena in the question and answer. She says, are there measures put in place for men who rape these girls once reported? And that's really your, uh, uh, Mrs. Robinson, you could probably say more about that. Or someone else on the line who has that information. The question is an important one, you know, what, what what is in place for men who rape these girls and it's reported okay so sorry i was just taking some instructions from my end so the question that crystal asked has to do with the penalties for persons who rape is that the case so um in terms of the law that would be something that we'd have to look at in terms of what bit of legislation exists for that i'm seeing judge paula blake howell online I think I saw Judge Paula Blake Powell online, and I know definitely that she works with the courts as well. So I'll just do broad strokes. And then if it is that she wishes to say something here, because we have a lot of conversations about persons who report, uh, you know, crimes that relate to rapes and just offending persons, violating persons, victimizing persons, and how the court deals with that. Um, as the ministry, we have a zero tolerance approach to any form of violence at all. And we strongly believe that any person who violates any person, whether it's a male to a female, female to male, we believe that once it is done, the crime is committed, then the person should be, should face their time of day, their, their time in the court, should own up to it. And we look at a holistic approach. So there is the person who was ab abused and aggrieved. How do we treat with that particular person to ensure that they are looked after, that, that they understand that 
there is a zero tolerance approach and how, what is it that they would need. So we have a national strategic action plan to eliminate gender-based violence. And that is a comprehensive plan that looks at five key areas that relate to violence and in particular gender-based violence. The first area is prevention. How do we prevent crimes? How do we do awareness raising? Prof, you mentioned a lot in your conversation in your lecture about awareing, um, awareness raising, raising awareness, and making sure the information gets out. I think that is very critical. In some cases, persons are not aware of what is in place and what their rights are. And so that prevention piece is very critical. I also see Desmond Kennedy from the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, and she has been working very assiduously and also doing research on gender-based violence, particularly in institutions. So I'm sure that um, Ms. Ken Mrs. Kennedy should be able to contribute to that as well. The second area in the plan would look at protection. How do we ensure that once a person is violated, what is in place for that person? Whether it is that the person needs psychosocial counseling and support, if the person needs to be moved to a shelter, which is safe. And at this point, we have three spaces. One is opened and we have at this point families in that space. The man himself who is a, a perpetrator, there's always scope for that person to come forward and to get help. If the person doesn't come forward, then it means the law can take it on. We saw recently where there were two children who were abducted, kidnapped, um, two girls who were kidnapped in the parish of St. Thomas, I think. And we saw where the community rallied and they understood the assignment. They took on the task and they put themselves right out there with the police and they went out in search for them. I think we're still wait, awaiting information on the perpetrator, which is not good because I think for some of the girls, they might be traumatized. and just wanting to know that this person has been taken away from a place where he's able to, to, to validate any other girl and any, for any other girl to not feel safe. The third um, area looks at protection and prosecution and how do we make sure that if a protection order is taken out, for example, that the protection order sticks. If it is violated, then how does this person get support? So you might be aware that the Domestic Violence Act has been amended and some sections of it have been approved in the cabinet office. And so one of the amendments is to look at the definition of domestic violence, which initially did not carry a clear definition of what domestic violence entailed, and the parameters of domestic violence. And so that has been broadened. And that's because there were so many persons in Jamaica and overseas, part of the diaspora, who wanted to have their views heard on this vexed issue of domestic violence and gave us several submissions through the Joint Select Committee of Parliament, which were folded in and were submitted. We also saw where the penalty for the breach of a protection order was significantly increased so that it would send a strong message to perpetrators that if they breach a protection order, then it is not looked at lightly. Another part of the NSAP looks at redress, compensation and reparation. How do we ensure that if somebody is aggrieved, if somebody is traumatized and victimized, how do we get redress to them and in the shape and form that is deserving? And the fifth one looks at protocols for data collection. How do we coordinate data? How do we collect data to, to make sure that when somebody needs the data, it is reliable, accurate, timely, and contextual. And so we cannot do this alone. And that is why we have things like these, a lecture that allow persons to be able to listen to data and to understand how they fit into what is happening. So absolutely, once somebody perpetrates, once somebody um, violates, once somebody is, 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 is guilty of a crime, then there is a penalty that is supposed to go with it. And if the person doesn't come forward, then it means that the police can find a way to reach those persons, whether they get the support of the citizens, the support of the family members, or support of intelligence that allow them sometimes on the ground intelligence to find these persons. But the idea is that every crime that is committed, the person who commits the crime ought to face his or her time of day in court. And the victim, the accused, ought to understand that there is a caring society most of us who understand that being a victim is not a walkover and there are certain things that are required to cushion, to allow, allow persons to heal and to feel as if they are important and to affirm them certainly and to find solutions to restore them so that they become a part of society. 
and are able to contribute. I don't know if Mrs. Kennedy or uh, Judge Paula Blake would like to share anything at this point, or if you, Prof, would like to add to that. No, I think you, I think you answer it. And I think what, what, what I know, and I think what many of us know is that reluctance to report rape or a sex on for sex is because they're not sure if they will be protected. So I think that's a big issue. And then also, I think, you know, sometimes girls don't understand that what happened to them was rape, that when they said no, and they didn't want it. So we also don't, we need to just, we're not, we shouldn't assume that girls know what rape is because of how rough the society is and how abuse is so kind of thrown around. And so we need to have a very clear articulation and an education around what rape is. Rape is when you say no and a man or a boy force you to have sex, you know? And um, even if you went to their house, <laughs> you know, or even if they buy you food or because there are all of these variables where girls think, well, I went to his house or I went out with him. It doesn't matter. So um, I want to thank you for that information. And also to just say that, again, it's about educating and informing people about what their rights are and what the boundaries are. Thank you, Prof. So I just got a note to indicate that Judge Paula Blake is in court, so she will not be able to respond. And I'm also aware that there are three persons with hands raised, and I'm wondering if they could indicate when they ask who they want to have um, respond to the question, whether it's yourself, Prof, or it is me. I hope it is you. So there's Jeanette James. Uh, there's Denisha Vance Vogel and there's Nicole Irving. So I think we'll take Jeanette James first. Absolutely. Jeanette, no, they were saying mind. that they couldn't, um, Mrs. They Mrs. Yeah, they were saying that can the host uh, allow them I, to unmute? I think we've done that. We've asked for them to open it, so they should okay. try again. If they're unable to, then you could type it in the chat and we will have Prof respond to your question if it's directed at Prof or I will if it's directed at me. So in the in one of the questions, until we open the mic, an anonymous attendee who said she's, and, uh, she is a product of the Women's Center, a mother of three, teenager, but she holds seven CX, a uh, first class honors degree in education, and most important of all, this was when she was a teen mom um, and she wants to thank the Women's Center, so that's great. And her question is, uh, you know, and what's missing in my life as a child suffering from lower self-esteem and I'm not, uh, a sh you know, she's not ashamed of the journey. And so the question for her is, how do we inform more young mothers that there are better days ahead and it is not the end of the road? Well, uh, again, I want to say I think that the Women's Center does that. Um, certainly, I participated this summer and the, the girls seemed very well informed. But I want to emphasize that it's not just the center because so many girls, not all the girls go to the various centers. And so we really need the community to be sensitized, to understand, not to judge and condemn these girls, but to offer them support, to encourage them. Because what, what I have heard is that a lot of girls feel ashamed and are not given any support from the community at large. So let us be more empathetic, let us be bigger and more generous, and let us understand that the impregnation and the teenage pregnancy is a result of two, and we need to be compassionate and provide our young girls with the correct information. Thank you so much, Prof. Well said. I think uh, Jeanette, I was told that Miss James, Jeanette James can now speak. So would you like to try, Jeanette? Yes, um, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Okay, I am calling in, I am part of this this morning representing Grenada and the Program for Adolescent Mothers. And I should say that um, we started in 1994 with our program and we were fashioned off of a program run in Jamaica. So Jamaica, we consider you our sister organization when it comes to our advocacy and work on adolescent mother, um, adolescent mothers initiatives. Um, I think this morning's session was very informative, very, very educating. educating. And for, for me, it touches on a lot of the things we are touching here in Grenada. Now, fortunately, um, I've been 
voted in as the president for adolescent mothers in Grenada. Um, it's an honor for me. I was a teenage mother myself. My mother was a teenage mother. My grandmother was a teenage mother. So um, coming, being a product of that myself, I, it's a passion that I have. Um, when I, I got in, I realized that one of the things our organization do is that we have a, a school. So Program for Adolescent, and we shot is PAM. We actually have a school where the girls can come and continue their education. There we provide a daycare service as well so their infants can be there. Uh, part of the, the programs we offer is also counseling for the fathers. But in, in that area, it's very low in terms of fathers wanting to, sh to show up. And I think Ms. Palmer would have touched on a lot of the, the areas why. And in, in most cases, it's because the situations may have come out of rape or incest. And the, knowing that these fathers don't show up to be part of our programs that can really, um, I think, yeah, a lot of the time we speak feminism and we promote our women and we do so much for them, but we forget without men, there'll be no women. And so when I heard her, um, Ms. Palmer touched on the, the integration of our men into this process, I was very happy to hear that. Now, one of the things we are discussing in Grenada, and I think by extension, the region, is the reintegration of our girls into the school system. And um, just this week, it was a big discussion in Grenada. And I had to, we spoke to our girls in our school to see how they feel about the reintegration. And 99% of them said no to it. And it's because they are in part of an institution where they share a common understanding and, and, and um, com, you know, camaraderie where, you know, we're all adolescent mothers. Why integrate us into a system where we can be abused? And, and because teenage pregnancy is very much a taboo, not just for Grenada, but I think by extension, the region where we blame the girls a lot of the time without knowing their circumstances. So my question to Ms. Palmer would be, um, as we extend the process of reintegration into the regular mainstream system, um, I would say education is key. I want to know what um, advice can she give in addition to education of you know, the students, the teachers, the principals, and so, what um, advice can you give us as we thread forward on this new path of the reintegration? Okay, thank you for that. And that's an important question. In a case like Jamaica, we would need to have several schools because Jamaica has 14 parishes and it's spread out. So we couldn't, you know, in order for all our uh, adolescent parents to be in one school, it would mean they would have to physically move and all kinds of variables are import, um, would impact that. So what I want to say is that if you have a location where the majority of girls live in an area and have access to that area and they want to be there, then there's no problem. But other girls who want to go back to their respective schools should have that option. Now, what a number of girls have said to me is that when they went back to their respective schools, their, some of their classmates and the largest uh, children in the school, you know, would make comments about them, you know, and speak about them bullying or other kinds of things. So there is that variable. But again, it has to do with education. So I say it should be two pronged. If the, the country Grenada is much smaller, and I love Grenada, I've been there several times, if, if it's possible for them to be there, then of course that camaraderie, that sense of similar experience is very good for, for that kind of uh, young people. But I also don't think we should exclude reintegration because what we want to do is to also build acceptance, acceptance not about um, becoming a teenage pregnancy, but that people make errors they have a slip, but it doesn't mean the end of the road. And I think having girls reintegrated to their old school can serve as motivation for other girls. Um, and so I would say it's two prong. It shouldn't be just 
you know, a self-contained environment. And eventually they have to go back into an integrated society anyway, and they're going to have to face whatever flack or whatever issues that come up. And so reintegration into, into their respective high school could help to prepare them for um, what might come later. But of course it involves educating the entire school system and the girls and providing emotional buffer and psychological stamina so they can do that. I hope that helps. Thank you so much. And thank you for your work that you're doing and that what you're doing, the Women's Center has also been doing in terms of providing um, a space for the girls to be, for them to continue their education, childcare and those kinds of things. I'm seeing, uh, Prof, a question from Michelle Scarlett. She wanted to know if it is that the Women's Center encourages persons who have uh, walked through the center, who have had the experience of being at the center, if they are allowed and encouraged to return and to share their stories and to support the, the program. I know I have the executive director, the illustrious- I defer to her. Yeah, so I would want to know if uh, Doc would like to answer here, if you wish to, then please go right ahead. Doc, would you like to respond here? Mrs. Coburn Robinson, I'm sorry, would you please repeat the question? I was saying attention to something else. Okay. The question, Doc, is she wants to know that uh, Michelle Scarlett, for those persons yes. who have already gone through, they have had an experience with the center, are they encouraged mm -hmm. and inspired to come back? and share their stories and oh. to pay forward. Oh, very, very much so. And, and, and it, that question delights my heart because let me, let me expose it, Michelle, that Michelle is a past student. She's doing exceptionally well for herself in the US. She's an author and she, she has been paying forward to the girl, her sisters behind her. She's been uh, granting scholarships to the girls. She's been giving her books to the girls to read as motivational material and so on. So yes, that's the answer. The, the, the members of the alumni who are also on the platform have been paying forward. We, we open the doors and we create the space for them to come back and say to their younger sisters, we did it, look at us now. Guess what? You can do the same. So it's motivating to the girls to recognize somebody else went ahead of them and survived and were successful and they can do it. We do that all the time. All the centers open their doors to the alumni, to the girls um, to return and to walk beside their sisters. Yes, more of us should, more of them should do the same. Absolutely. I do agree with you 150%, uh, Doc. You do encourage and that is why, that's one of the reasons why we have this lecture because we want to educate and inform and just let the messages get out there that persons can actually be a part of the circle. I see the Women's Center as a second chance sisterhood and so many other things that we call it that allow us to be able to just reach out to each other. I also see Mrs. Ware on this call. Mrs. Beryl Ware, one of our very first Jamaican um, directors. I'm not sure if it is that um, Mrs. Ware wants to say anything, but while she gets her act together in terms of her thoughts, if she wants to say, I wanted to know if Prof, wanted to add anything here in terms of the fact that she has now been having conversations with the Women's Center and just looking at data for the study. Is there anything in what you've done, Doc, that would allow you to respond here, uh, Professor? Yes, I, <clears throat> um, I just want to detail what Dr. Zoe Simpson has said, and that it's very important for the girls to see others who have gone before and who are successful, which is part of why the book that I'm working on is about that. Because a lot of times we think, you know, we just can motivate them, but they will be more motivated if they see a woman who has gone through a similar path as they have and who can, um, you know, who, who, who is, is, is successful. So playing it forward is very important. And those of you who are have not been doing that and you might be on the line i really want to encourage you to do that um offering your services 
offering whatever kind of financial assistance you can, um, sending whatever kind of material you can, so that the young girls who are faced are in the place that you were, that uh, they understand that. I, I also want to say, and I don't know enough, so I don't want to speak out of kind, that um, I certainly would like to work with the Women's Center to make sure that we get some more data that will help us to understand more fully the uh, full situations of the girls that are being impregnated and also what are some of the things that they want which you might already have that data in terms of an exit interview what are some of the things that they want or they thought would have could have helped to protect them from getting pregnant um, you know we need to collect that kind of data if it's not being collected so that we can again have more information to empower future girls and the cultural implications in Jamaica. Wonderful, wonderful. I think I also see Mrs. Uh, sorry, Dr. Jenny Shevans Bogle. She has been extremely pivotal to a lot of the data and research that has come out in terms of teenage pregnancy. She was at the um, family planning board, Jamaica Family Planning Board. And so she has um, her hand, I think, was raised. So at this point, I think she's enabled. So yes. Dr. Stan, Thank you. Like go ahead. Thank you so much, Sharon, for giving me the opportunity. I feel like family uh, <laughs> with the Women's Center, Zoe, um, having been working in close collaboration over the years as when I was executive director of the National Family Planning Board, and now that I'm at UNFP. Prof. Adiza, it's always a privilege and an honor to hear you speak, and uh, thank you for your excellent presentation as well as the, the passion and the inspiration that you provided this afternoon. The question that I'd like to ask is going to be a little bit contentious because it resides around a term that is not often used except to say we don't discuss comprehensive sexuality education in a frank and open way. I think because CSE, for short, is not well understood. CSC is actually a curriculum-based method of teaching and learning about cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality. So it's not about sexual grooming. It is not about uh, giving children license and, and young adolescents license to have sex. It aims to prepare children and young people with the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, and the values that will allow them to attain optimal sexual and reproductive health, as well as well-being and dignity. We'll teach them how to develop respectful social and sexual relationships on how their choices will affect their well-being and to be able to protect their sexual and reproductive rights throughout their life course. In Jamaica, this is particularly necessary. necessary. Prof. Adiza already has spoken very articulately about the issues of adolescent pregnancy. We know about the early sexual debut in Jamaica, the incest, the gender-based violence, the first core sex, 50%, according to that reproductive health survey, a little bit outdated, but there's one currently in the field. But there's also substance abuse and misuse. There's negative peer pressure low self-esteem, lack of parental guidance, COVID-19 with the lockdowns, ladies and gentlemen, over 200,000 young people, it is estimated, are out of school as a result of COVID-19. The pressures that they face being locked down with the perpetrator of the gender-based violence. Young people need to, boys and girls, adolescents, boys and girls, need to be able to be taught the skills to protect themselves. Jamaica is already, uh, in terms of the gender inequalities and the limited access to accurate CSE, uh, the poor parenting, they all need to have these skills. My question is to Prof Adiza. Prof, how do you think we can soften the enabling the environment and the landscape so that there's a true understanding of what comprehensive sexuality education is and how it may be taught both in and out of schools to prepare young people, girls and boys, to protect themselves. Okay. 
Thanks for that question, and I want to thank you for your work uh, that I that I that I draw on. Um, you know, we have to be, we're so hypocritical as a society, and we've somehow made sex and desire wrong and, and, you know, out of place. So I think it's the first thing, and that means we, all of us have to recalibrate what, what that is. And as you say, so rightly say, is that giving them this information is not endorsing early sex. We're simply saying, we know you have a lot of feelings, and we want you to understand the full gamut of this so you can make decisions whether or not you want to have sex early and if you do decide you want to have sex early then you have the contraceptive and the knowledge that is there so i think it is it's, it's an attitude shift that needs to happen in jamaica around the education and the social system and how we tend to make certain things wrong so even though we know it's happening mm -hmm. in a project, um we hear it in our music we have made sex this bad thing and we have made talking about it um taboo so that many girls still you know it's not until they get their period that there is any conversation about that and then they hear what i heard if you play with boys you're going to have sex you know you're going to have a baby and it doesn't kind of compute so we have to be honest we have to stop being hypocritical and we have to understand that providing our young people with accurate diverse information about sex and sexuality and feelings is not promoting early sex it is just providing them with ample information that they need in order to make right choices i Thanks don't know for that. Is... thank you for that bro. thank you thank you mrs uh, robinson wants to add something to that no no not necessarily i think you've done a great job of responding to that what i saw is that um we had sort of thought we were wrapping up but i'm seeing um mrs pauline russell brown is it um with her hand up and i know she has worked very hard um along with i think this, if, if this is a person i know she has been very instrumental to a lot of work around um reproductive health and just teenage pregnancy so at this point her hand is raised I would like to invite her, and I think this might be the last because of the time, <clears throat> to raise her comment or to ask her question here. Mrs. Russell Brown, do you wish to go ahead? You can. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks for the, the opportunity for contributing this last um, comment. It's not really a question, but it's a comment. Just to congratulate the woman sent on the second um, lecture in the C. Pamela Matney lecture series, and to address the issue of reintegration. Um, reintegration has taken a long time to be achieved in Jamaica. It's been years of effort um, and, and it, it, it's, it requires not just education because um, we know that people know uh, that early pregnancy cannot be the end of a, of a young lady's life. We have examples of women who have done well who became pregnant while they were at school. But because of, and, and your lecturer um, raised it, the hypocrisy in our society, the religious norms that influence our, our thinking, which says that if you're pregnant, we have to hide you away somewhere. We can't allow you to come back into the system. So besides education, it's going to take a lot of advocacy. And over, um, Mrs. Mrs. Um, Weir, and Dr. Simpson can give us the history of how long it took to get to the stage where the policy was actually approved and, um, and, and now being implemented by the Women's Center across the board. So that Grenada can learn a lot of lessons, keep in touch with the Women's Center and let them share with you some of the strategies that were used to get principals, to get parents, to get teachers, to get the churches to understand the value of allowing young women who become pregnant to return to school once they have their babies. The other issue um, associated with reintegration is the support that's required <clears throat> for these young ladies, not just um, material support, but psychological support. And this may have been addressed earlier. I, I joined late, so this may have been addressed already. But those are two very important areas to support the reintegration of young women back into the education system. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Mrs. Russell Brown. I do think I recall you being on the committee as well, so you would be able to speak definitively to the policy, that reintegration policy. And it took a long time before it was approved, and I'm sure you are very happy that it was approved. I think we're at this point where uh, it's going to be revised, but I'll leave that to Doc, Professor, sorry, Dr. Dr. Ann Simpson will be able to speak to that in terms of where we are now with the reintegration policy, very ambitious policy. And, you know, I know you were one of those persons advocating for it to make sure that it saw the light of day along with Mrs. Barry Weir, who is also on this call. I do think, though, because of the time and we want to be time efficient, we might not be able to take any more um, questions. But I think you can raise your comment, raise your questions and put your comments in the chat. Doc is ready to go. She's ready to give closing remarks. And I do believe she should be able to share with you what's on her heart as well in terms of the fact that this has been such an awesome lecture. So over to you, Doc. You can have your space now for your closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love to call your partner, Sharon Coburn Robinson, my sister agency, principal's, principal director. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. What an afternoon this has been for all of us. Certainly my heart abounds with immeasurable gratitude to everyone who participated in one way or the other to this fourth edition of the annual Pamela McNeil Lecture on Adolescent Pregnancy. Mrs. Debbie Ann Brown Salmon, the chairman of the board of directors at the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, you certainly set the stage for the forum with the introductions and the warm welcome that you extended to all. Thank you very much, Chairman. Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson, you ably moderated the afternoon's undertaking with your usual sense of poise and posture. Thank you so much, Sharon. We extend an abundance of thanks to Ms. Camelia Isaacs for the inspiring rendition that encouraged the adolescent mothers in particular to keep their dream alive very well. Thank you so much, Camila. By introducing today's presentation, Mrs. Avigay Carr, our human resources manager, ably thanked us, ably helped us to gain insights into the qualification and professional sojourn of our presenter. Thank you, Mrs. Carr. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that Professor Opal Pam Disa, her thought-provoking, engaging, insightful, inf and I can go on, informative presentation has certainly unearthed and brought into sharp focus the reality that adolescent pregnancy is equally about the girls as it is about the boys. We thank her for bringing to our attention the reality that nearly one third of teen girls who have dropped out of high school cite early pregnancy or parenthood as a key reason for their having dropped out. If that were not bad enough, ladies and gentlemen, she helped us to understand that only 40% of teen moms finish high school and less than 2% of teen mothers go on to finish college by age 30. It says to me that we have work to do yet at the Women's Center in Jamaica, in Grenada, in Suriname, wherever we are. We have to sit up, square our shoulders, and begin to think of how we are going to change these kinds of statistics and make better for our girls and our boys. Certainly, these kinds of statistics are antithetical to national development. And I am certain this afternoon, as we close, that everyone listening is already strategizing on a response, a personal response to these realities and the role that they will con commit to playing in influencing the needed change. Many thanks to our events planning committee here at the Women's Center. They worked tirelessly to ensure that this compelling lecture this afternoon was delivered as intended to meet the stated objectives. Thank you all, Mrs. McKenzie and her team. It would have been no good for us to have planned and delivered this lecture without an audience. And so we recognize the presence of the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sports and other members of staff of the ministry. 
the members of the board of directors at the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, the immediate past president director, uh, the immediate past executive director of the Women's Center, Mrs. Beryl Ware, you laid a formative foundation on which we can build today. Thank you so much. Our partners who are here, UNFPA, UNICEF, Planning Institute of Jamaica, Planning Family Planning Association of Jamaica, the Jamaica Association of Women Judges, the Jamaica Library Service, colleagues from the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, colleagues from the Guidance Counselors Association across Jamaica, colleagues from Northern Caribbean University and Sam Sharp Teachers College, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Members of the Women's Center alumni wanting to pay forward, wanting to be a part of the conversation as to how they can assist the sisters behind them. You are here and we thank you so much. Friends and well-wishers of the program, our dollars and mothers in Jamaica, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Special thanks to the attendees, of course, from across the region who graced us with their presence. We had Grenada, representatives from Grenada, from Guyana, from Suriname, from the USA, Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to everyone who attended this afternoon as we looked at the driving factors of adolescent pregnancy and sought to have identified and apply the related solutions. Many thanks to the Jamaica Information Service whose technical support ensured that the lecture was facilitated and delivered with standards of excellence. We recognize also the presence of the Jamaica Observer and we're sure that you will be covering and providing us with some media um, publicity. Rest assured that we, we at the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, we will not rest until all our girls are protected and assisted to become their best selves. We are also committed to assisting our boys. They're an equal part of the equation and we will also assist our boys to adopt and live a lifestyle of sexual responsibility. We know that we owe it to our youngsters to help them to position their lives in a positive direction and that we shall. All things being equal, we intend to continue to call for action on Thursday, November 17, 2022. Until then, Join us at the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation as we seek to enable every adolescent mother to continue her education on the digital environment that now obtains. And we, as we seek to help her to complete her secondary education in spite of the pandemic. Whatever contribution you can make, we will receive with open arms. The lives of our girls and our boys certainly matter. Ladies and gentlemen, do please have yourselves a thought-provoking and action-stirring rest of afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doc, for very uh, ably closing the session. I'm just leaving you with three words. And the, uh, these three words, to my mind, would sort of encapsulate all of what has been said and also just my personal take on it because time is far spent and I don't want to delay. So I'll just use three words to, to say, I have enjoyed every second of this session and I am certainly very, very well informed and I feel motivated and inspired. So my three words are one, awareness. I've gained so much from here and I'm certain I speak for everyone else, awareness. And that awareness has allowed us to feel affirmed. I certainly feel affirmed by all that has been said. And now that I am affirmed and you are affirmed, we ask you to move into another space, advocacy. Go forward, use what has been learned, what has been garnered, what has been shared, so that you now can go and impact your world in huge ways. We have learned a new word in COVID-19, pivot. So I encourage you to pivot for purpose, purposeful positioning and to ensure that as you partner with us, the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, we will be able to increase our visibility and do so much more. I thank you. I think we have come to the end. So if there's nothing else to be said, then I look forward to having you at our next session. You heard Doc said next year's lecture. In the interim, you could read about the center, get as much information as you can, and just be prepared to be a part of what is happening. 
thank you so much. Do have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And I love the three words you've left everybody with. Thank Affirm, you. Affirm, awareness, and advocate. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening.